I learned in ultra marathoning, you just pushing yourself, push, push, push way beyond what, you know, most people, a marathon is like, oh my God, a marathon, which it is a big accomplishment, but it's nothing compared to a hundred miler or 200 miler. Yes. Well, so no, once you take those shackles off about what you, what you thought was extreme and then you're like, wait, what people do, what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, then you're doing it yourself because you've trained your body to do that. Then you, even in regular life, you have more confidence. I mean, you guys know, you know, of course you, you lift, you know, get a PR bench 405 for whatever you have more confidence going to the store, right? Of course. Yeah. 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 So it's the same thing. It's like, you can, you can, you know, humans are so, there's so many, so much or so, I don't know, so many factors weigh into being a human and our minds are so powerful, but you learn that, that confidence thing that you can gain in one thing can carry over to other things. And it's, uh, I, I don't know, that's running and hunting has done that for me oh. in life. What's up, y'all? Uh, because this episode talks a lot about crazy stamina and doing insane hunting, here's the program we're going to give away today, MAPS OCR, Obstacle Course Racing. So work out like an obstacle course racer. This is a very different kind of program, and you can win it for free, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS OCR. Also, we got a sale going on right now. We have a bundle of programs on sale and we have a single program on sale. So here's what they are. The bundle is the starter bundle that includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. The program that's on sale is MAPS Split. That's a bodybuilder style program. Both of those things... 50% off, huge sale. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code MAYSPECIAL for that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. I want to start us uh, because you said something that I just wouldn't have thought about uh, with hunting. I think hunting, more relaxing, peaceful, but we were talking about uh, hunting grizzly or uh, lions. Like, I think that uh, you would have to have people that are similar and Justin made the point like of like these rock climbers that climb with no rope or anything that like, is the there a solo guys? Yeah. Right? Like the, is it, is that what it is? Is it an adrenaline thing? And are there, is it a certain type of person that is attracted to that type of a hunt? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just know for me, I can't speak for anybody else, but I just know I like the being testing myself at the highest level. And that's, you know, whether I'm running, um, you know, even training hard, uh, bow hunting and to me, grizzlies, dangerous game. Um, in Africa, you know, there's Cape Buffalo, which are called black death. There's those lions, like you talked about, and then grizzly bear in North America, brown bear here too. Um, those, if you're not at your, you know, if you, if you make a mistake, you're hunting deer or elk, they just spook and run away. Yeah. You make a mistake hunting something that can kill you. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of, you're, there's a risk. And so it requires you to be at your very best. So do you, is there like levels to this game? Like you, you hunted certain game for so long and then eventually said, okay, I'm ready for this. Like how did that transition work? Yeah. I mean, basically I just started, I grew up hunting. So all I could afford to hunt really was deer. And so that's what everybody did. You just deer hunted. And then, you know, there'd be a, a question, you know, back at high school or whatever. Oh, did you get your buck? You know, and that's just, did you mm. kill a, a buck deer? Mm. And so it transit, it, well, it evolved and that the same thing where my training at that time was just, you know, like the, the weight, the concrete filled plastic weights, oh, you yeah, know, yeah, the 8.8 yeah. 8 pounds and all that shit. <laughs> and, um, so it was training with those and doing five or 10 K's to now you, to now I hunt dangerous game and I, and I run hundred or 200 mile races. So it's like, there's that whole journey. And just like with lifting and training, like you guys know is, you know, you reach a plateau, you push hard, you reach another one. You keep moving that that goalpost and, you know, you're 20, 30 years down the road, you're a completely different person. Now, what, what's the... How, what's the insurance if you, let's say you go, I don't mean like literal insurance, but like, do you have to carry a sidearm or something that can protect you? If let's say you go and hunt a grizzly, you hit it, but it's not a mm -hmm. lethal shot and it's coming for you. Mm -hmm. You just pull out another arrow. Like, what do you do? Yeah. What? Uh, mo most people wow. take sidearms. Yeah. They'll take and you a don't? I don't. Wow. No, why not? Is it just because you want it just to be as pure as possible? Yeah. Um, wow. My attitude and I don't, people won't get it. People can criticize. It doesn't, I don't really care, 
But if my intent is to kill the animal and in turn it kills me, that's the way it goes. Mm, wow. That's that's what we're doing. Wow. It's like a purist way of looking wow. at it for sure. Kind of. I mean, I I don't know. People can criticize anything and they whatever say I'm just talking. But um, I did make a shot on a grizzly this last uh, about a year ago from right now. And uh, I thought I hit it perfect. And I hit a little forward arrow went through the front of his chest. It looks it got one long apparently. Anyway, so we're blood trailing it. And it's got super thick and the alders there. And I didn't want any guns there. I wanted to go down. I wanted to finish this bear. And um, in, in Alaska, a guide is required. I would rather just be by myself. But by law, a guide is required for dangerous game up there. Um, so there was a guide there and then a couple buddies too. We were filming it. And I just, you know, said, don't shoot it. Don't, you know, we, we spotted it. It was wounded. And at first we thought the bear was dead. The guy said dead bear. So it was like, you know, that felt good. And then it, it raised its head up. So obviously it wasn't dead. And I just said, don't shoot. And I, I got down, I was about um, 10 yards from it. And I was, is in the thick alders and I was at full draw trying to get an arrow into it, but you have to have a clear shooting lane. And it, the bear charged um, guide, I'm pretty sure it happened really fast. Shot missed. Um, one of my buddies had an another gun and hit it in the back hip. And I hit it in the chest as it charged. And it got to about four yards. And it was just, it. Um, I felt bad for the bear because I, I didn't want, I don't want a wounded animal. I don't want the animal to suffer. I'm trying to kill it as mercifully as I can and make a good shot. So I felt bad in that. And then secondarily, I, my, my hunt, I felt, uh, it was tainted a little bit because I, as you, your words, I'm a purist. Um, I don't want guns on my bow hunts and I've never had to have that happen. Never had anybody have to, or I've never had to finish an animal with a rifle. So, um, but the point is if it was just up to me, it just would have been me and the bear and I would have either killed it or not. And that's just the way it goes. But so that that happens. I don't. I don't take a gun. No. Is bow hunting considered more merciful than uh, a bullet? I think if it's done right, you know, people who who might not know <clears throat> think that a gun would kill quicker. But what happens many times? Like I've killed a lot of bull elk, big animals, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred pounds, a thousand pounds, even some of the Roosevelt bulls I kill in Oregon, and they're so wound up and they fight all the time. So an arrow hitting them through the lungs, they don't even really feel it. They just, sometimes they act like nothing happened. A horn happened. pierced them or something? Is that what they think? A horn pierced them. They, you know, they get jabbed by sticks. There's, you know, it's it's rough living out in the mountains your whole life, right? And they're 10 or 12 years old. So they've been through a lot. Um, so they can't, they don't really know what happens. And then all of a sudden their blood pressure drops and then they're dead. Where a gun, a gun will kill by shock. A, an arrow kills by hemorrhage, the blood I talked oh, about. A gun, it's shock. So there's broken bones, there's a loud sound, there's, you know, uh, muscle torn apart. They definitely know they've been shot. So if you don't make a perfect shot, it's doing a lot of damage and there's a lot of shock. And so to me, the most merciful death for an animal, they're all dying too. I mean, it's not, nobody's making this, this out alive there. So they're not living till they're 80. It's not in a nursing home. It's not... They're either dying from starving or predators killing them or another animals killing them, another, you know, their same species. So if they're going to die, which they are, um, I think the most merciful death for any wild animal is a well-placed arrow. I had, I had no idea about yeah. that. Would you, it be, um, would it be six? Cause now I'm trying to think of the, all the different variables. And cause off the top of my head, I would, I would have thought what Adam said that, a, that a bullet would have been more merciful because mm -hmm kill them fast or whatever. Yeah. Do people miss more often with bullets because of the distance? In other words, if I have a, a gun, I'm assuming, so I, I don't know anything about hunting. So yeah. this is just, you know, pure question. I'm assuming with a rifle, I'm going to be at a further distance, mm -hmm. which also would make it much more difficult to be accurate. Do you, mm -hmm. and, and, and you'll probably see more beginners using rifles. So do you see more wounded and you got to keep shooting them type of deal with guns than you do with, with arrows or... That'd be, that's hotly debated. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because, um, yes, they shoot further, but they're also more accurate. Mm -hmm. So 
there's more rifle hunters. So in by and large, bow hunters in the general population of animals kill less because there's less bow hunters, there's less successful bow hunters. Hmm. There's more hunters in the grand scheme of things, higher success rate. So with those, people are imperfect, things happen. So the the wounding rate is probably greater with the rifle, hmm. but it's because there's more of them. Okay. The percentage, it's hunting is about personal integrity and it's about doing ethically what you think is right. Everybody has different ethics. Some people, I want to make a perfect shot. I, I put a lot of a pride in killing that animal quickly. Some people, um, maybe they get too wound up in the moment and shoot when they're not ready and kind of lose it for a second because it's so intense and don't make great shots. And, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I try very hard to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Some people might not have that same approach. Mm. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's about as hard as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about the uh, precision. You, you mentioned that for what it takes to, to actually pull this off, the work that goes into that, the mm -hmm. 10,000 hour kind of rule for, yeah. you, you would kind of suggest for somebody to get into bow hunting because it is, it requires so much more attention to detail. Yeah, it's definitely a rep related endeavor. I mean, just like lifting weights, you know, you don't get good at lifting weights overnight. You don't get big overnight. So it's the same thing. Um, that 10 to thousand hour rule, a lot of people throw that around. Um, I don't know that it's that. I'm not sure what it is because I've seen people who've been doing it for 30 years, like myself. I, I think this is my 34th season who still make errors. But those reps definitely do help because when that animal comes in, it's such an intense or you stalk the animal and, and that it's like the adrenaline is pumping so hard that it's like a crescendo. Sometimes it's like just r your eardrums feel like they're, it's just flowing. Right. And, and I remember the first bull I ever shot at in 1989 bull came out of the, it's reprod it's logging country. So reprod is where the timber has been cut and the new tree has been planted. So the trees were about 20 foot tall and they, they parted like the, the parting sea. And then this bull comes out and, uh, I was on my knees sitting there watching this bull and his big black horn, seven by six Roosevelt bull. And I was watching it and my arms felt like they were asleep and um. it's like tingly. And I was just like, I didn't know if I could even pull my bow. Hmm. So with that type of adrenaline, those type of intense moments, <clears throat> it's really hard to master the shot. With reps, you can make the shooting subconscious because it is that precision. You can be so far off by one little error. So reps help definitely, but also time in the mounds, time being close to animals, um, learning. It, you kind of have to be a little bit of a biologist. You know, we talked about if you before we started recording, if you hit an animal, you're you're reading the blood, so you're doing a little sort of a live autopsy, I guess. What do you mean by reading the blood? Like, what are you looking for with that? Color of blood. Uh, the, oh, it'll be different color based off of where it's coming from? Yeah, liver hits dark. Mm. Oh, uh, shit. Lungs are lighter, pink, kind of sometimes they have uh, bubbles in them from the lung, from a lung hit. Mm. Um, yeah, an, an, art, an artery. Muscle's going to bleed different than if you hit guts. Guts will, the stomach will be a clear fluid. Um, the arrow might smell, it has a stench to it because it goes through the stomach. Um, so yeah, there's the type of hair that's on the arrow or that's on the ground. Belly hair is different than back hair on the animal, whatever animal you're hunting. Uh, different colors on deer. There's white hair on the belly. There's there's dark hair along the back. Oh, interesting. So it's, you, a lot is going into you. you so as I said, a biologist, um, you need to know um, anatomy. Um, and then also you need to know what the animal, how they might react to the hit. You know, what are they going to do if you hit an arrow, if you get them in the stomach, um, you need to know how an animal will die from that. And so what to do if you hit them in the lungs, what to do, uh, you need to know where they, if they're wounded, where they might go in bed, um, how they react after the shot, given the tracks. So you're looking at the tracks in the ground, how they run off can be an indication of how wounded they are. So you, all this, so much goes into it. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the reps help, so the whole point of that, the reps help the shot, yes, but there's a lot to successful hunting, more than the shot. But if you can control the shot, well, then you're controlling what you can, because you can't control all that other stuff, Yeah. right? So with anything, to answer your question is, 
you do everything you can to control what you can. Mm. So what, okay. So you say your arms freeze, like in that situation, mm -hmm. you, you just, would you rather hold your shot or would you, um, you know, try to kind of work through that, uh, in that moment? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, like, and how do you sort of, how do you get past that first step? I guess, if you do have that kind of reserve going into that, that big of a moment. Um, you know, it's, uh, why, why do some quarterbacks rise up and with the game on the line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do some people get up there and brick a free throw? You know, so it's kind of that it's, um, everybody goes through the same people internalize it, deal with it differently. They have a different mindset. Some people might be quote built for it. You know, people like to say I'm built for this, mm -hmm. that maybe that's true. So some people might really never master that moment. Some people will be able things, as they say in sports all the time, things slow down. It feels like slow motion. Mm -hmm. You're doing exactly what you practice a million times and it worked just like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Many times it's somewhere in between to where your arms are tingling or everything slows down. It's like, you just want to find that sweet spot where it's still working and uh, you're still mastering now, it. You've taken... Uh a few like well-known individuals now that you're known for doing this on hunts, any, anybody surprise you, uh, with their ability or maybe the opposite where you thought, Oh, this guy's going to do pretty good. And then this isn't for you. Um, yeah. I mean, I hunting doesn't care who it is. <laughs> you know, the, the, they don't money doesn't matter. Well-known doesn't matter. You know I mean? It's one of those things. It's just like you put, 225 or 315 on the bench doesn't matter how rich you are <laughs> it's probably not going to get it off the rack if you know unless you got some strength so uh yeah i mean one thing i will say joe is because i think he's been training his whole life he might he it's been it's a journey to learn that all the different factors i variables that i threw out there but as far as mastering the shot he's so dedicated to whatever he does you know whether it's jujitsu or comedy or podcasting so archery it's been the same dedication to that so he can make the shot he definitely can make the shot um so he's been good uh i mean pretty impressive how how well he can shoot yeah i would um, imagine ever, people who, who um who've fought or people who've been in combat probably are more likely to be calm in a situation where they're presented with an animal mm -hmm. and they have to make a shot versus like if you've never experienced that kind of stress um, then it might not, might be not ha know how to kind of handle it. You know? Yeah. I mean, you'd think so. I mean, he, he I, I think he'd remember this, but the first time I took him to Colorado, first time we had two bulls coming in bugling, which I don't know if you, you guys, have you guys heard a bull bugle before? No, no. Mm -hmm. It's anyway, it's like this high pitch yeah. scream. It's so intense. So we were in this Creek kind of a, a pretty sharp Creek, uh, drainage coming down very tight, which means, it was maybe 50 yards across it. So we were in the bottom of it. Two bulls were coming down. And uh, it was coming down at crunch time, which means something's going to happen. The bull's going to see you. You're going to get a shot off. It's, something's going to happen. And he said at that time, that was 2015, he said that was the most intense thing he's ever done. Oh, wow. That moment. Of all the things that he's done, too. So, yeah, you talk about uh, all the things you know people... <clears throat> and fighting and it's just different mm -hmm. it's just every probably each each uh um what a discipline has their own sure uh i mean you got to master that that discipline but i think the preparation and going into it you're probably mentally more prepared but still that's still going to be it's super still new. intense still new still, new still a new thing how did you how did you become known for for doing this kind of stuff like earlier off air you're saying how where you grew up everybody hunted mm -hmm. how did how did you end up becoming known for for doing this um well i i mean i always wanted to be a writer that's what i wanted to do i i always enjoyed sharing my stories sharing my experiences <laughs> And so I wrote a, I killed this buck when I was 15, this little spike buck. And I wrote this English paper on it. And the, the, my English teacher in high school said, oh, you're pretty good at this. I probably, I still probably got a D on it or whatever, but, <laughs> but trying to make it feel better. Yeah. Just, well, I was just, just lazy right. on the grammar and all this, but I think the, the storytelling 
Yeah, that's, that's funny. A, that's a whole different part because <clears throat> people can be very good at grammar and everything, but not good storytellers. Sure. I tell these. I have the same experience. So I was really? actually in advanced English, but I'm the worst grammatically yeah. oh, still okay. to this day. He makes so, up words still. It's yeah, I'm yeah. still, I'm terrible, but my, but my he can tell a good story. Yeah. My oh, English yeah, teacher came stories. to me and said like, you write really well, yet it would be all chalked up red. And right. Would, yeah. So I have a very similar maybe, story. Maybe it's the same. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and it's like, it's a lot, it's like a lot of things. It's like some things you just can't, unless you have something in you, it's hard to really be great at it. You know what I mean? So to be a storyteller, it's hard to train to be a storyteller. Mm. Either you can tell a story or you can't. Now, putting that on paper is a whole different thing. But anyway, so um, he said, what did he say? Oh, he said, you should write for the school paper. And I'm like, I'm not writing for school papers. How dorky is that? <laughs> you know, I was playing football, <laughs> and, <laughs> basketball, baseball. So I was like, but anyway, I remember him saying that. <clears throat> and I remember that felt good to get some positive feedback on my writing. And I was like, okay, well, I like to tell these stories. So uh, transition into a uh, bow hunted I killed a, another spike for my first bow kill and a spike bull elk. And I wrote a story and it got published. So that's just kind of started this journey as I wanted to be a, a hunting writer. Mm. And then from there, I self-published my first book and it, you know, barely sold 5,000 copies. Then I got it. I was an editor for a bow hunting magazine. I got, you know, pretty much got uh, rejected by all the big magazines. I want to write for Bow Hunter was a big magazine. Peterson's Bow Hunting was a big magazine. They would say, "Oh, you got the basis for a good story, but you need to blah 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 work on all this." So I just send it to a smaller magazine, and they'd publish it, and I wouldn't pay, make anything, but my my name was in there, so that that felt good. Anyway, so then I wrote another book that was very popular, and that's kind of how it's where, how we got here. Then I was on started being on TV, hosting things, and. Uh, um, got a little bit of a following and then Joe saw in 2014, he, he likes watching YouTube videos, still does. Mm -hmm. And I was carrying this, one of the training things I do is I'd carry this 130 pound rock up this hill by the house. And it's about a 1100 foot gain over a mile and a half. And so I'd carry this big rock and Joe was like, what is this guy doing? Carrying a rock for what, for bow hunting? Mm -hmm. So he he tweeted and invited me to come. I just posted it today, actually, because it's kind of where this journey started. But uh, asked if I wanted to come to LA and be on the podcast. Oh, that was you guys' first encounter. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, wow, interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. Are there um, competitions in this space? I mean, I have I know very little of it. Are there competitions where you can go and compete against other hunters and not hunting, but shooting? Okay, so, yeah, so yeah. Def definitely shooting, but not hunting. Did that ever appeal to you? Because I know you have, uh, and I don't know if these guys know this or not, I actually, uh, not long ago, heard you talk about um, your dad. Your dad was like quite the athlete. So yeah. do you have that in you also? Do you have that kind of athletic competitiveness in you? Uh, I, I'm very competitive. Yeah. I was, I'm not an athlete like he was. I mean, he was a, um, an amazing athlete. And uh, just, you know, how what happens a lot of times is – start drinking um he flunked out of the u of o uh and was you know had incredible potential and uh ended up going to oregon state same thing happened and so he had like this amazing natural ability i i don't really have that um i you know I've, i would just run and just play football like what everybody did and was okay but not not is, like what he was. Is there? It seems like there's a a lot more interest in in hunting nowadays. Is that true? Is it is it gaining a lot more people than before? Is it something that's is it gaining popularity? Uh, Western hunting definitely is. You know, I think overall numbers of hunters might be going up slightly. Um, but the the allure of Western hunting in the mountains and living this adventurous life, and you know, like. A lot of men want to, you know, it's it's like this genetic thing, I think. I mean, we're here because we were hunters at one time. That's mm -hmm. how we survived, right? right? So there's something there's something in all of us to be a hunter. You know, in a city, it's hard to feel it probably. Um, but I think there's something to it when people talk about it and explain it. And then I know a lot of men hear it and they're like, I want to know what, I want to know what it's like to go in the mountains, um, kill my own meat and bring it home to my family. I mean, that's, there's a big draw 
these days to that that mind that story. Yeah. Well, I, so I, I I've never hunted, but I've always been very interested. And in, in what got me most interested is I had a client once who was uh, for ethical reasons, for their own reasons, was vegan, mm -hmm. and we would have these conversations. I'm definitely not vegan. I eat lots of meat. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, we had this whole conversation around it. And you know my you know my point was, well, you know, we hunted as humans, and this is we're mm -hmm. apex predators. This is why we're here. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, have you ever killed your own animal? Mm -hmm. I said, well, no, I never, I've, I, I, when I see meat, it's in, you know, yeah. it's, it's in wrapping at the grocery yeah, store package, type yeah. of deal. And so that made me feel a bit like a hypocrite. And so mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I think I'll, I'm going to do that at one point and yeah. see kind of what that's, what that's all about. Are there more, more men wanting to do it for that reason right there? We're like, Hey, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never done this. Let that was see. Joe's exact journey. Really? Okay. He, and he'll say, I heard him say recently on one of his podcasts, it was going to be one way or the other. It was going to be, he's going to go vegan and mm -hmm. not eat meat because he didn't feel right about it, or he's going to be a hunter. Oh, interesting. You know, what's interesting in, in this, just through my own reading, I didn't realize mm -hmm. how big of a role hunters play in preserving the environment. Yeah. Conservation. Conservation. Yeah. So I had no idea. So, um, and oftentimes you feel like they're at odds because you have the, the you know, animal rights people like don't hunt. That's terrible. Yeah. And, but, uh, I, I, I think you could probably make the argument that in terms of conservation, hunters probably are more responsible for conserving more than even the, than even environmentalists. Would, would you say that that's a fair statement? Yeah. I, the, the whole thing is both sides have the same interest. We, hunters do care about the animals. I mean, which seems odd because we kill them, but also our money is what goes to conserving the habitat, the species, um, creating better habitat. Like uh, some some places are very hot and, and dry. So hunter money through hunting and our license and tag sales goes to making water holes for the animals. And that helps, you know, they can get water when it's dry out. Mm. Um, but just we pay for biologists to study the the uh, animals and their numbers and the and the land has what's called a carrying capacity. So as human humans encroach on wild lands, basically as the cities grow, the land has less carrying capacity of animals. All all that needs to be studied to to figure out how many tags hunting tags should be allocated for that area. So that's all funded. That has to be funded by something, and that's hunters that fund it. So. Hunters care about, just like anti-hunters care about the animals, hunters care about the animals too, but it's just coming from different directions. So, uh, yeah, hunters definitely pay for for more than anti- Anti-hunters are very vocal and they <laughs> are very passionate, I'm sure, about their beliefs, but they're not, very few of them are writing checks. Mm. Well, that's interesting. You, you, know, mentioned, you, you mentioned, Cameron, when we first started uh, Critics and this kind of, this conversation kind of is going that way, like- what are some other misconceptions uh, that you the, out there from critics about hunting? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, just that we're you know bloodthirsty killers out there. Um, there's a stereotypical hunter which is driving around drinking beer, maybe you know not not respecting the land or the animals. So that's a pretty lazy. Even even in Hollywood, the movies like yeah, a hunter is hardly ever a good guy. It's usually some. Uh, some redneck hillbilly mm -hmm. so you know because of that and because a lot of people grow up in cities and they're not exposed to hunters they a lot of people attach that stigma to them mm -hmm. the hunters i know are very committed very dedicated to training to being their best they care about the animals they don't want an animal to be wounded and suffer and that's that's what i see and there's a great sense of pride in procuring your own meat as we talked about um you know, it's easy to go to the store. It's definitely easy to go to the store and buy meat. Um, but our life is built on convenience these days. And I feel like, and you guys know, because you train, totally. you see, you see what the what the general population, what percentage are asking of their body or taking advantage of what the, the ability of their body. It's, you know, it's people are capable of amazing things. And, and it's hard to, realize that when you're living in a, a a time of convenience and you're never cold, you're never hot, you're, it's a time of comfort. So I just, I like how hunting kind of strips that away and you're, you're actually out there seeing what you're capable of as a, as a human. Mm. Um, I think there's a, it's so powerful. Yeah. I mean, it, look, we have a nature 
And if you take us outside of that nature, I think it's important to understand that nature. You take us outside of that nature and inevitably we will have side effects. And what we try to do is medicate those side effects away. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you don't exert yourself, you don't get sunlight, you don't challenge yourself, you're going to feel anxious. Yeah. You know? And what we try to do is medicate that anxiety away because we're denying certain aspects of our nature. I don't think we need to go back and live like cave people. No. But it's important to understand that. I mean, you take an animal out of its environment and they behave, you know, studying animals at the zoo is mm-hmm. very different than studying animals in the wild. In the wild. Mm-hmm. They're very, very different. In fact, if an animal grows up in the zoo and you put them in the wild, they'll, they'll starve to death. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the big problem is we don't quite understand that at all. And then we wonder why we feel... Yeah. depressed or anxious or sad. And, you know, just in our space, we, you know, we go, we go do these interviews and we went to these obstacle course race interviews and mm-hmm. you interview the people doing these races and they're like engineers and, you know, people that sit behind desks, like, why are you like crawling across your belly under barbed yeah. wire and yeah. jumping over this wall into freezing water? Like, why are you doing this? And like, right. oh, and they don't know how to put it into words. They just say, right. oh, it feels great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you're, you're, because you've denied your nature so much, mm-hmm. you need this outlet um, and hunting is something that, I mean, I can't, there's, hunting is very much in our nature. In fact, I was going to ask you this. You, you must laugh when you watch those, um, like those, those naked and afraid shows oh, where survival they, show. yeah, <laughs> where they got the, you, you ever watch the ones where there's like a vegan? Yeah. I'm out here to, yeah. I'm going to try and survive. Yeah, like, let's see how long they last. Right. They'll, eat, they'll eat anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any dead point, animal. Right? It's like, might not even be dead yet. And they'll <laughs> yeah. Eat it. yeah. So They're like I mean, collecting berries and twigs. It's, and it's, squeezing poop it's, and it's water. Easy. Right. I mean, it's easy to be passionate about about when it's survival's on the line, all that's out the window. And you really strip down and you're like, okay, this is what's important. I just need calories. I need to eat. Yeah. Oh, this is about survival. Um, of course, that's not everyday life. But I think, you know, you talk about being medicated. I, you know, I, I feel bad for, you know, depression's on the rise. These mental issues are on the rise. Anxiety's on the it feels like it's on the rise, but are those, what are those people getting out of their, wherever their apartment or their office or whatever, are they exercising at all? Are they getting, you know, going on a hike? And it's just like, I don't think anything, there's no medicine that can beat coming in and getting a good lift for an hour. You know what I mean? No. It's like, I don't, mm-hmm. those people don't feel, I, I don't think that, I mean, depression on people that go to the gym regularly, I think is pretty low. You're right, actually. So I, I, I've said this before. It's like people have headaches and mm-hmm. they're taking ibuprofen, but what they're doing is they're banging their head on the wall. And so mm-hmm. you got to tell them, hey, if you stop hitting your head on the wall, it would stop yeah. hurting. You don't have to keep taking these right. painkillers. But yeah, studies show that exercise um, is at least as effective as medication at um, helping with the symptoms. But as you follow those studies along, exercise starts to outperform because obviously you become adapted to medications and receptors right. down regulate and all that stuff. Whereas exercise continues to pay you dividends. So right. it comes like anxiety and depression, it crushes because it's your nature. You need to move. Yeah. Um, what's your, what's your, what was your scariest place that you've ever hunted or scariest, to, you know, experience? Hunting? Scariest? Um, scariest. Well, when I was in Tanzania, I mean, so there's dangerous and scary to me. So scary. I'll explain the difference. Yeah. First. yeah. Right. <laughs> they both scare me. What do you mean? Yeah. Scary was in Tanzania. Um, there's a lot of poachers there. And so they're, they're having a lot of pe- problems with poachers sneaking in. And um, they weren't like the, there was a dead elephant there, but they weren't necessarily the ivory hunters. They were after protein. So again, Everybody here, you, you're hungry. You want to go get a burger. You go, you can go to 10 different places, much different in Tanzania. So Mm -hmm. they have people that are out in the, in the wild killing animals for protein, but they're sneaking on places they're not supposed to be. And so they'll kill these animals. They'll hang them up to dry out the meat, put the meat in gunny sacks, have straps on the gunny sack, and then take it back to town and sell it. And so that's, they're just after protein, but they will kill to get it. Hmm. And, and there, uh, we were hunting one day and I, I looked about 150 yards away and I, I saw this, a guy standing there and, uh, I said, uh, you know, I was with the guide there and I said, I, I said, I see a man and he's like, where? And I said, 150 yards standing right there. I said, he's not moving. And he goes, get behind this tree. 
And uh, I said, are we going to get shot? And he's like, just get behind this tree. So he yelled at him in Swahili and just said, leave. Guy didn't move. And uh, so that was, then I saw another guy. I told him, I said, I saw another guy up in the rocks take off. And so they, they have guns. You know, I looked at the binoculars. He had a, the guy down there had a gun. I didn't, didn't see if this guy had a gun and ran off to the rocks. But anyway, so they have guns. They're willing it's it in certain situations there. If there's a risk, it's almost who can shoot first, right? The poachers or the hunters, because they don't want to get caught. They're willing to kill you to not get caught, right? right? Wow. And and then of course you got to protect yourselves. So you know it's whoever can shoot first, almost. So that was pretty intense. Um, I went up. So the guy ended up circling around, and he came about fifty yards away, and he's standing there. And the reason why he came fifty yards away is because they don't have bullets. They have a gun and they kind of have to make it into a, a muzzle loader, which is essentially like old style where you put uh, gunpowder and a, and a, and a, and a wad in there. Then you put, they didn't have lead for a bullet. So they'd put screws and ball bearings oh, and wow. things like that. And then they can make that go off. But the effective range is very close. So he was 50 yards away from us because he had to get close to shoot. Anyway, the guy I was with told him, you know, leave, and um, he ended up, he did leave. And then I went up to where that guy was in the rocks and I found a bunch of their stuff, a bunch of the stuff they're using for ammunition and also uh, this white powder. And, and uh, the, um, who I was with said that that white powder, that's what the witch medicine doctor says, or witch doctor, I can't remember what he said, but back in the village, he would, they'd put that on their wrists and on their neck and they say that would make them invisible. So I think when the guy was just standing there, he thought he you was invisible. <laughs> and then he's just like, it's like, fuck, my powder's not working. He's like, these guys are yelling at me. they see me. Yeah. So it's like- I want a refund. Yeah. So they, they say they're going to be invisible and that'll help them on the hunt. Right? So that's kind of their- Their- uh, Philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Ritual there. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so that point is, that was pretty scary because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to- to men and and those, I'm used to animals and, yeah. and I'm not really worried about that. But uh, the harder to read, right? You don't know what a person's going to do. You don't. I mean, humans are pretty unpredictable, especially with weapons. And so I didn't. You know, we ended up another time. We were driving in the jeep. We we're going to hunt, try to find these buffalo, and uh, I saw. I said poacher, and it's about eighty yards away. And then the uh, you have to have a. It's like a kind of like a game warden. and there has to be one with like like people from the United States over there hunting and there has to be one in the party and as, almost as soon as I said that he shot this guy behind me shot and he's like I got him whoa and I said no I said I was watching I said he goes I got him in the leg and I said no you didn't get him and uh but I mean it was just like no just shoot shoot wow, wow. Holy so that cow. was that was the pretty, wild wild west it feels like it um so that was the scariest, I guess you could say. And then the uh, sheep hunting in Alaska, uh, in super steep country, ice, snow, all that. That's probably the most dangerous. You know, bears bears have their own risk associated, but um, the mountains, uh, the mountains can win. You know, and you know, so the, the danger is the environment, yeah. not necessarily the animal falling, yeah. falling, and so. Uh, and then that 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 was the country that that was 2008. I killed a ram there, and then my my best buddy who got me into bow hunting in 2015, he fell and he died there. Oh, so it was wow. just like same same country, but that's like um, for dangerous. That's about as dangerous as it gets, just because you can't control. You don't know what what the situation is going to. Now, be. in a situation like that, does that also? make that like one of your kills you're most proud of or do you have a specific kill that was like yeah, this was like the one um, I'm most proud i mean of? it's memorable for sure i mean they're all they're all special in their own way i mean and and probably some of you doesn't hunt probably sounds weird to say kill special but um killing an animal it's you know it is life and death it's uh there there's need to be some weight associated with it. Like you're a burden you're carrying because you're taking this animal's life. And so they're all, when I say special, I mean that it's meaningful. Right. And they're all meaningful in a different way, whether it was um, who I was with, the situation, um, what I was going through at that time, maybe personally, um, you know, after Roy fell and died, you know, the first hunts, 
after he was gone who who got me into bow hunting those had a different weight to them oh, um so yeah mm. i mean they, they'll to answer your question um there's some that are more memorable uh, you know me and roy's last last hunt is memorable that sheep hunt was very memorable because it was pretty dangerous uh the experiences um you know in africa are amazing but then sharing like joe's first hunt when i took him or you know i hunted with luke bryan before for bear those those are memorable too yeah. Because, uh, yeah. yeah i was just gonna say because of the way that you approach hunting and there's almost kind of a spiritual element to it mm -hmm. it's like you're bringing it back to, to to ancestral ways of of doing this have you ever been approached or been a part of like like a native tribe for instance mm -hmm. like uh, being able to get in with the way that they kind of perform their rituals and go into the hunt and all that is that something that you've ever been a part of um i mean I have a little bit of Cherokee in me and I have a, actually a Cherokee card, but you know, it's not like I have a ton of Indian, but as far they, as they make cards. Yeah. Yeah. You can get it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's like a membership card. Or? Yeah. Oh, it's wow. Like, it's like uh, the tribe. Oh, interesting. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, very Yeah. Cool. So, uh, I have that, but I do hunt the San Carlos, uh, Indian reservation every year. It's Apache. And, uh, it's like the, the premier elk hunt in the country. It's like, just magical country. And uh, when I go there, I, I have so much respect for the people and for their traditions and how they honor the animals and, and for the animals themselves in that country. But the, the country seems, um, I don't know, I, I feel more connected there than almost anywhere. And I don't know if it's just in my head because, you know, there's, we, we have this, you know, uh, what was that movie with Daniel Day-Lewis? Oh, Young Guns? No, no, no. Uh, he was last, an in, he was, oh, last oh, last yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I don't know if it's from watching shows like that forever. <laughs> yeah. So you just so you have it, you're already you're kind of prepping yourself to like, okay, I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to feel something more special here. Uh, but when I've been there and looking into these big canyons where not a lot of people hunt because it's so remote or they're so deep or whatever, and you know, I'm like, I feel like I I remember we were standing there before and, and the wind was blowing and I, I had in my head, it seemed like the the mountains were moaning. That was the wind. And so I don't know if I'm making it up, but I feel something different there. And when I kill a bull it, there, it it's, uh, um, I don't know if it's more meaningful, but it's different. And it's, I do, I think there's a more of a connection. Um, they have sunrise dances there and I was invited to one, but I haven't been to one yet. So they have ceremonies there that I'd love to be, um, if I'm allowed, be part, just at least um, witness. And then, you know, even like we had this, uh, this, she was, I think, I think she's full-blooded Apache, but she would come in and cook. And so I would sit and talk to her and hear all the stories and talk about even the food she's making using the acorns there uh all i mean i'm just like i can't get enough of that stuff so mm -hmm. yeah i think i think hunting has made me more connected to the land and the animals and then native american tradition has enhanced that mm -hmm. even so it's more about like just the remoteness and like you being immersed in in like the ultimate nature that not a lot of people get to yeah. experience yeah i mean when i hunt if I see a boot, another boot track, I'm just like, oh, it yeah. sucks. Uh -huh. You always want to be, think that you're like exploring or you're in, you know, you're you, me and Roy, who's a, my buddy who got me started hunting. We'd always want to go over the next ridge. There's this draw to go further and deeper than anybody else and get into this, you know, the promised land mm -hmm. basically. So, yeah, I mean, that's always the draw is like the most remote, the most rugged uh, where nobody else would want to go. And you're there that, that's that's as good as is that what led you to the ultra marathons yeah, i, I mean is, say. is that part of the strategy of that of like if i can run and push this limits i can go beyond most people yeah because ah. with the way i grew up it's all public land so it's basically everybody's against everybody to find the best hunting area and i i learned pretty quickly that the mountains you know i hunted the eagle cap wilderness in oregon which is oregon's lar largest wilderness i mean you guys have some bigger ones here uh like the Trinity Alps wilderness is huge and that's up in Northern California. Marble mountains is a, a good one, but it's not as big, 
but the Eagle Caps is 30 miles wide by 60 miles long. Big, big mountain range, Wallow Mounds, they call them the Little Alps. They're super, they're rugged, uh, deep, remote. And, and when I first started hunting there, I was like, God, this is, this is a lot. It would, they'd break me pretty much, oh, wow. you know, and I, it's very hard hunting. And so I was thinking, man, if I could run, you know, I knew I, in my head, it's like, if I could run a hundred miles, I could be anywhere back in here. I could hunt anywhere. I the, the mountains would never stop me. And so it was kind of connecting all this and wanting to be the best I could be in the most rugged country that I learned in ultra marathoning. Um, you know, it's just, you just pushing yourself, push, push, push way beyond what, you know, most people, a marathon is like, oh my God, a marathon, which it is a big accomplishment, but it's nothing compared to a hundred miler or 200 miler. Yes, well, so no, once you take those shackles off about what you, what you thought was extreme, and then you're like, wait, what people do, what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, then you're doing it yourself because you've trained your body to do that. Then you, even in regular life, you have more confidence. I mean, you guys know, you know, of course you, you lift, you know, get a PR bench 405 for whatever you have more confidence going to the store, right? Of course. Yeah. 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 So it's the same thing. It's like, you can, you can, you know, humans are so, there's so many, so much or so, I don't know, so many factors weigh into being a human and our minds are so powerful, but you learn that, that confidence thing that you can gain in one thing can carry over to other things. And it's, uh, I, I don't know, that's running and hunting has done that for me oh, in life. Totally. So, so if, when you're hiking in 20 miles, which I'm assuming is not super crazy going at, you know, 15, 20 miles to find the right place or whatever, and you kill a 900 pound or 800 pound animal, how do you get it back? Yeah. So like, so if the animal ha is 900 pounds on the hoof, which would be a big bull. Okay. Um, you're going to have about say roughly 300 pounds of meat. So the guts, you don't haul out the hide. You don't haul out the bones. You don't haul out really like the rib cage or anything mm -hmm. like that. You might haul the leg bones because the quarters are attached to the leg bone. So you can bone it out, which means you take all the meat off and then you'll have 300 pounds of meat. So 300 pounds of meat. If you're by yourself, you can carry probably a hundred pounds. It's going to be very hard if you're super deep. So you go say if you're 10 miles back, so you get 10 miles out with hundred pounds, 10 miles back empty, 10 miles out with hundred pounds, 10 miles back empty. So what are we at? 40 miles there, Damn. last load, 10 miles, 10 miles. So, so there's six, go back and forth. 60 miles. That's crazy. Wow. And, and 30 of it is with hundred pounds. Hardly <laughs> anybody can do that. Hardly anybody can do that. That would be super extreme. So they either make more trips with lighter weight or they get pack animals, horses, mules, mm. llamas even. We used to have llamas because horses were super expensive. So you could buy a llama for 150 bucks. They can carry uh, they could carry 60 or 80 pounds. Now, the llama doesn't come with you on the hunt, right? Cause they, or, or do they? It's like back at camp. You, you leave them back at camp. Got it. Yeah. Then you go get them and come back. Yep. Oh, I and, see. And, and llamas were good because like if you have horses, you need a horse trailer. If you have a horse trailer, you need something to pull the horse trailer. So you're, it's a, there's a lot of money involved there. With you don't need llama, that with a llama? With a you llama. You just throw them in the back seat or what? <laughs> you, you can put a llama. I've seen a llama in a station wagon. Shut the fuck <laughs> up. That was a joke. You, you really like, could? You just that. like push them in and their heads down like this. And, and it's just like. <laughs> what? I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. yeah. Spit so, on people on the road. <laughs> so we would have a Toyota two-wheel drive and made, we had no money. You know, we got to remember this. No money at all. But Toyota two-wheel drive with plywood walls Shut the and have up. four llamas back there. Shut that's, up. That's awesome, dude. <laughs> oh. Bro, I can just imagine seeing that drive by you on the freeway. Oh, what the it, fuck is yeah, this guy so doing? We're talking about the stigma of hunters. Like we were, we were ruining it for hunters right there. Cause they're like, look at these fucking hillbillies. So that was us. Wow, I didn't even know that was a thing. That's yeah. crazy. So, when you, so uh, any worry that a predator is going to find your kill at that point? Are you more vulnerable because now you have a dead animal and then maybe they right, can like smell? Some wolves come along. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, there's a risk, you know. With okay. you know that's how they live. So especially in wolf country, which we don't have a ton in Oregon, they're they're moving in now. Um, I don't think you guys have them here. Maybe up in the Sierras, maybe, but maybe, probably not. Um, but yeah, I mean bear country. You got to 
get your meat up out of the, off the ground in a tree and they can still get it if they want to, but you're just trying to get that meat out as soon as you can. Oh, and interesting. What, what has been one of the hardest treks like that? You're, we were giving the example of if you went 10 miles in, you, like what has been one of the hardest like hauls for you? Uh, I killed a, I killed a bull 12 miles back once. I killed one 10 miles back once. Um, the 12 miler I had, I went, I walked 10 miles. I had these other, knew these other guys were on the other side of the basin. Well, other side of the range that we were hunting. So I went over to them and I said, Hey, I killed a bull. Can you guys help me get it out? I'll, you know, buy hotel rooms and pizza and all this. And so we all, we made one trip out 12 miles and then back in. And it's like that, even that, yeah. the guy who, I, who I rode over there with, he's I mean, like, that's a marathon, right? He's there. like, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. That's a marathon. He goes, I I'm ready to go home. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I killed it opening day, which is the first day of season. He was done. I gotta go home. <laughs> it's just somehow. it's like he got pizza though. Yeah, he did get pizza and he got a hotel room, but it's it is so hard. Yeah, because well, yeah, so you're not walking like on well, no, flat you're, ground. You're 12, 12, 12. I mean, you're you're basically running a marathon, hauling something. But you're also going in, through like the woods and you're climbing on over that shit one. And, so I made a mistake on that one, which could probably cost him his hunt. But so the trail went around this whole ridge and down this thing, and it was twelve miles out, and I was like. Well, if we go over to the edge here and the river straight down and the road's right on the other side of the river, I go, that's only five miles. Well, there's a reason why the trail doesn't go that way, right? <laughs> but on the map, you're like, that's not very far. So we go over there and we're starting to head down and it's so steep and boulders and we got all this weight on our back. And he ended up falling in between these rocks backwards. And if he would have been by himself, he would have been, oh, there's no way to get out. Luckily, he, you know, he could have hit his head because you got a hundred pounds pulling you back and you fall. I mean, you could have hit your head and who knows what you could have died. You know, I'm trying, not trying to be dramatic, but anyway, it wasn't a good situation, but we were there. So we've, you know, got all torn up, going through brush, had to cross the river at the bottom. And it's just like, oh my God, that was, it was shorter, <laughs> not easy. <laughs> so... It's the, you know, the, the point A to B isn't always the best route. Yeah. And so anyway, that was, there's, there's just a challenge. Once you get an animal on the ground, um, it's a whole nother yeah. part of the hunt. Yeah. yeah. You, but the you, reward is great. I wanted to ask you, uh, like what in your opinion was like, uh, the best tasting meat or like both the best tasting and also probably like not the best tasting as well. Like. One versus the other out of all the animals. <laughs> um, well, my wife made liver last night, and I'm not a big organ. I mean, it, it's like, oh, no, you know how good this is for you? And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. Believe <laughs> me, I know. I heard it all. I'm not eating it. And she's like, I'm, it's going to be so good. So anyway, she made up this liver, and I, I hate onions too. But anyway, she made up all these onions. Oh, it's Awful, <laughs> awful. So I can't do that. Okay. Um, a lot of people feel that way about bear, but uh, I I like bear meat. So I heard it's greasy. Am I? That's that, what everybody says. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, do them eating berries does that play a factor in it? Yeah. The so of it depends it on what the animal's eating. Yeah. If if it's eating uh, berries, it's going to be very sweet. If it's it depends on the time of year because a lot of times they're only eating berries when the berries are in season. Um, if it's a bear that's on, like in Alaska, on salmon, it's not going to be as good mm. because it's just, or if it's eating. It's probably more fatty, I would imagine. Well, th they'll eat anything. Yeah. If it's rotten, it doesn't matter. Like a like a mountain lion, they have they want fresh kills. A bear will eat, they could, it could have maggots on it and mm -hmm. they'll eat it. So if you're eating a bear that's been eating maggots, <laughs> it's probably I mean, not, not going to be so tasty, good. Yeah. Probably not going to be the best. <laughs> but I killed this bear last year in Colorado that was eating acorns were in, and it was eating those nonstop. I mean, it was so just gorging itself. It's a big old boar, which is a male bear. They they uh, a sow is a female, a boar is a male, and it's this big old boar. We figured maybe 20 years old, and that meat is so good, and it's just like. You know, it'd be like, so he was total keto. <laughs> He's like all protein okay. and just a beast, right? But the meat is just delicious. Um, but as far as the, one of the best meals I've had, it's it's always been when I've killed a bull 
in the mountains and stayed back and cooked the meat over the fire. Oh, right. Oh, interesting. And so, well, experience the the experience makes a big the difference. With the, I'm sure, I think yeah. so. You of course, know, the you restaurants a, know that. You go to a restaurant, yeah. You got the candlelight. Yeah, you got the whatever. You got the everybody's whispering. How's the meal, sir? So it's like it's all about the setting, right? Well, for a hunter, you can't beat the setting of in the mountains where the animal lived and and you know, eating a backstrap would be like. Um, it's like the T-bone, the backstrap is the muscles right alongside your spine. Mm. So that's just solid steaks right there. And, uh, that's, or a tenderloin is on the inside on the, like it'd be right under your spine. And there's, there's two tenderloins there and that's the best meat because it's in the body cavity. It's, you can like almost, you got to cut it a little bit, but you can almost tear it off. And it's a piece of meat about maybe. 12 inches long by about three or four inches and it's the best steak you'll ever have okay. so if you're cooking that on a stick over a fire in the mounds where you kill the animal can't be yeah, now, earlier you mentioned i think you it was a buffalo you said it was black death i think you named it yeah or? a cape buffalo cape in Buff africa now why is it, are they just one of the most dangerous i've heard that they kill more people than yeah Okay. Yeah, they kill a bunch of people so, there's there's more of them which is why but. is it just that they're super aggressive and they're aggressive yeah and you've hunted them with a bow? Mm hmm I killed killed one in uh, 2014. Holy cow. Now, where do you try to hit an animal that big? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming in the chest somewhere, but... Yeah, lungs. So yeah, through so the side? Want, yeah, you want to get behind its, behind its shoulder. And then they have super heavy ribs, almost like a two-by-four. And that's... They're 1,500 pounds. Yeah. Solid muscle. Super thick hide. Um, just pissed off i mean they're it's hot they're black it's like it couldn't be any more tougher conditions to live you know in that in that environment it's just a harsh environment you know there's lions there it's like it is definitely survival of the fittest back there hyenas hyenas are just ruthless and so when an animal is everything's tougher the people are tougher the animals are tougher the country's tougher Everything is tougher. Oh, so trying to kill that with an arrow is, uh, you know, I, I hit this bull good, 63 yards, made a good shot. And I was like, I put my arms up. I was like, oh, thank God. You know, I was so happy I made a good shot. And if if that was an elk, I feel like it would have went 50 yards, piled up dead in seconds. Bull took off, ran off. And I was just like, I said, did he go down? And there's like this big herd of buffaloes. And uh, I, I said, did he go down? And, her, and the guy I was with said, I, I didn't see him go down. The name Ryan is who I was with. And uh, and so I said, let me get on that. You know, it's kind of hard, <clears throat> a bunch of buffalo tracks. So we went around. I climbed up on this termite mound, which the termites make this big, like probably 10 foot high. I climbed up there and I was looking and I could see him. And I said, okay, I see him. He's, he's down. And Ryan goes, be careful. You know, there's a saying, seen, I've seen a lot of dead buffalo kill guys. Mm. So people think they're dead. They get over there. They, it's not dead. You're dead. You know, because <laughs> you get grounded in the, so I ended up, I had to, it wasn't the prettiest thing, but it just happens. I had to shoot. I had one arrow left. I hit this bull every time in the chest. So tough. It was just taking them. And then, so finally he said, he goes, if, if he gets up after this one, I'm going to have to shoot him with a gun. And I said, I said, don't, I don't want you to shoot him with a gun. And I said, he's done. But I'd been saying he's done for the previous five errors. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he was done, but it was a tough animal. That's crazy. So for people like us who are interested, but zero experience, we got no experience with hunting whatsoever. What's a good place to start? For someone like us, you know, we're interested in, in the experience. Obviously, we've never done this before. In bow hunting or right, or just hunting in general? Hunting in general. I would assume that bow hunting is far more technical. So I'm assuming that's probably not the best place to start as a beginner, or I don't know. I'd love your well, opinion. Well, yeah, bow hunting is harder, I think. Um, but the thing is, like, with there's archery pro shops. Like, um, how far is San Diego from here? Is it? It's, it's, it's pretty far. It's yeah. pretty far. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure there's an archery pro shop here in town. I yeah. just don't know what it is. I just know of Bobby Fromm owns the one down in, in performance archery in San Diego, but I know there's, there's one around here. The thing about an archery pro shop is it's kind of like a bar, 
you kind of go, people go in there and hang out and BS. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot just from BSing to hunters, mm. you know? And also then you're shooting and you're kind of getting good, good at the discipline of, of archery learning. Um, people will say, oh, you've never hunted? Well, you should check out this, you know, whatever. Got it. With rifle hunting, uh, maybe it's because I'm not a rifle hunter, but maybe a gun shop would be the same thing. I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, a gun shop here. I don't know if you guys have firearms, but that might be a place to go talk. But a lot of gun shops are just catering like home protection or mm -hmm. people with everyday carry and not not always hunting. What uh, a archery pro shop is pretty much always hunting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say one of the two, a gun shop or an archery pro shop. Yeah, I've actually seen um, there's this new – so you've heard of like Frisbee golf. Like, mm -hmm. So there's been like courses kind of set up yeah. like that with archery. Yeah, yeah. And 3D courses. Yeah. So yeah. that was something that I had just noticed. I didn't know if that was like a new thing. Or no, that's been around, that's forever. Been around forever. But that's a that's another th fun thing. So you go and you, they have these foam <clears throat> targets set up and they have a stake that you shoot from. And you get there, you go through your routine, you pre shoot an arrow at the target, you score it because there's different rings on the target. Like, mm -hmm. you know, hard as a 10, eight, five for a body shot. Um so yeah, and then that's where you, you talk to all the guys. They everybody's mm -hmm. new at one time, so everybody's kind of pretty helpful because nobody's born a great bow hunter. So yeah. it's like it's like it's uh, everybody's been on that that learn the bottom of that learning curve. Yeah, I I, I have to ask you this just because I heard a podcast where you're kind of talking about like some some Hollywood actors techniques and like yeah. You, oh, yeah, yeah. you're able to kind of break down, um, you know, their form and yeah, um, that's it, fun. Yeah. I just maybe like a few of the, the best examples and worst examples, I guess. Yeah. I did that for GQ. Uh, the best was I, I can't, God, what was, it was actually a cartoon. It was brave, brave. Yeah. With the girl with the yes. red hair. Yes. Oh, they got good oh, technique my God. on there. She's yeah. nailed it. Really? <laughs> she had great <laughs> technique. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like this, girl can shoot it didn't just, even get you like yeah. no well i wonder i wonder if that means i what i would think when you said that right away what came to mind is i bet you disney actually probably yeah went and they probably videoed a real good bowman right you and then hope so but yeah and then probably but they don't do that all the time either right because i've seen <laughs> oh, like yeah. i think it was robert de Niro. Look like an idiot, you know. And uh, that was Kevin Costner. How's Robin, Robin, yeah. oh, Robin Hood? That's right. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I never saw that one. Oh, you didn't see no, that? No, I didn't. I never saw Robin Hood. Uh, because he splits the arrow. I mean, he's yeah. yeah I mean, it's got to be better than his English accent, though. That's what Brave yeah. did too. She yeah. she split the arrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the bet. Let's see who. Well, Rambo is pretty cool. I love. I just everybody loved Rambo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that he, wasn't good technique, was it? No, it wasn't. He okay. kind of he had the boat canted a little bit, which means it's not straight up and down. Yeah. It's, it's kind of at an angle. It's kind of like when you see the guys in the movies yeah, that we, shoot the gun like sideways. Exactly. Like, you're just like, yeah, bro, so you ain't hitting nothing little, like that. Little ghetto -ish. So, yeah. I don't know. so you can't blow up a helicopter with a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the bow no. and a grenade at the end. No, that was pretty badass when he did it. And I also love how shredded he was, and you know he looked oh, like yeah, a beast. A but beast. Uh, uh, God, I don't know. There's who had the God, sometimes uh, she did train. Um, what was that? Jennifer Hunger Lawrence? Games. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, there yeah, you go. She, she trained. Yeah, so yeah, she did pretty good. good. So the kind of uh, physical fitness that you you need to be able to do these kinds of things, it sounds like a lot of just stamina, like just the ability just to endure um, these long treks and the ability to just kind of, you know, weather the, 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 the environment a little bit. It sounds yeah. like that would be the most important. So if someone's listening, they're like, Hey, this is something I want to get into. Mm -hmm. Strength is important, but you really want to have the ability to just to be able to do this for yeah. a long period of time. Is that is that correct? I think so. You know, there's a kind of a analogy, or not an analogy, but I just know from from experience, everybody's fired up the first day, the second day they're still doing pretty good. You know, get some miles in the first day. Second day you might be a little beat up from all the miles the first day. You know, you're kind of new mm -hmm. to the mountains because you've been living in the city. Second day, maybe not quite as good. My my thing is I want to be as good on the 10th day as I was on the first day. Right. Mm -hmm. Because on the 10th day, I should be better. Uh, I should be more in tune with the mountains. I should have a better idea what the animals are doing because it changes all the time depending on the weather, depending on water, depending on feed and whatever, if it's a breeding season or not. So I should be more dialed in on the animal and their behavior. And I should be, if I'm if I have that endurance built up, 
I should be more mountain tough because I've been in there 10, 10 days. Most people, they're good on day one, day two, a little bit less. By the 10th day, they're pretty much worthless. Mm. They're probably at home <laughs> um, by the 10th day, actually. So, but if you can still, if you had 10 days to hunt, which is, you know, a weekend, a whole week and another weekend, that's a long hunt. On that second weekend, you should be at your best. Awesome. Cameron, do you, do you think uh, hunting has made you a better father? Yeah, definitely. Um, th what, so that is absence make the, makes a heart grow fonder, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when you're in the mountains by yourself, oh my God, you, you think about every mistake you've ever made, mm -hmm. you know, every, I'm going to tell my kids, I love them. I'm going to, when I get home, we're going to do this. And I said, I was going to do this with them and I never did, you know, it's just yeah. like you like a lot of time to think a lot of time to think a lot. Of, but on the flip side is I've seen, I've seen guys who maybe had an argument with their, with their old lady before they left or their girlfriend or whoever, and they get back there and you can make some crazy, I mean, she's having an affair. <laughs> oh, she is. Having, oh. She's having, I got to get home. Yeah. I know. You know oh, wow. Just mess, you've mess with yourself. it so much, right? You've yeah. overanalyzed everything and it will screw up the hunt. So the, a big thing is making sure your home's in order before you go on the hunt. Oh, wow. Because it's, I yeah. Could, I could just see that you're on your way out and your wife, you know, your wife's like, hey, you, you didn't do that thing I said. You're like, honey, I'm about to leave on my hunt. We can't get <laughs> yeah, arguing right I know, now. Screw you I up. know, yeah. Because, but the thing is, is you just, we're so, I guess that's another point. We're so distracted in normal life. You know, when are totally. you ever just sitting by yourself thinking? Yeah. So in the mountains, that's all there is. Yeah. Absolutely. People aren't used to it. And I think I've written in a book, but um, one of my books is like, you real, you find out who you really are with that much time by yourself. And some people don't like that person. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's like, just it's just too it. real. Yeah. And they're just like, okay, I, this is not for me. I can't do this because yeah. we humans no nowadays kind of need that distraction. It mm. seems like. Do you find it very meditative? Oh, I do. Yeah. Oh, totally. And yeah. do, do, is, have you ever had like a spiritual experience doing this? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, just, just in general, I just feel for, feel more in tune and, you know, a deeper connection, yeah. I guess, to, to why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing. And I mean, if you want to call that spiritual, I was gonna say, that's, that's, spiritual. Kind of, that's kind of spiritual. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I've just, I never, I don't know. I just enjoy it. It's, it's, I need it. You know, I feel, I feel, you know, we talked about, I hate talking. I hate podcasting, <laughs> even though I've had a podcast, <laughs> but I feel more at home in the mounds than I do. I feel like a lot of times we just kind of go through, I, mm -hmm. I like meeting people. I like hearing people's stories, but I, I like being in the mountains more. So mm -hmm. that, that's gotta be interesting um, for you then because of all the attention and fame you have now, you have well over a million people following you on social media. You've been on TV. Um, how has that been? Cause you're not someone who I, I think that would seek that type of attention. So how have you handled that? Has it been, um, everybody likes attention, you know, whether you say it or not, it's like, you want to be validated, I think. Um, but what I like is I like, uh, sharing what hunting means to me mm. and how I like sharing the positive aspects of hunting. I like exposing people to hunting and, and the lifestyle. So if I have to kind of wade through the storm of some dipshit on Instagram every once in a while to, to like in the end hunting wins yeah. or we move it in the right direction a little bit, mm -hmm. we break that stigma or the stereotype. I can deal with that. Um, I would rather, be in the mountains with somebody exposing them to something or sharing something with them or like running. I like running. I, you know, if I can, I like finding the very best at whatever it is they do and training with them Yeah, in the mountains, you know, like the Courtney's the ultra runner, best in the world, or this other girl I run with Emma, she's an Olympic steeplechaser. Um, Goggins, of course, these people that I can, I can uh, become a better person just by being around them and seeing how, how, their mindset is no. how, how savage is Goggins. <sighs> yeah. He's, 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 I've always said, I go, we don't need a bunch of Goggins around. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he, it would be a rough go if there's a bunch of Goggins walking around the street. <laughs> just demoralizing. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's tough. I mean, and the thing about him is like what I said on Rogan too, is 
when it gets harder, he gets better. Yeah, that's I cool. mean, he gets he gets in and he talks about this. It's like there's the David and then there's the Goggins. And I saw it firsthand. It's like he flips his switch and he's doing more reps at the end than he was doing at the beginning. That's wild. Yeah, it was. And then after all that, then he does 100 pull ups every day to to finish the thing. And then in the ultra marathon, he uh, was having some issues with his feet. You know, ultra marathons do this. They tear up your feet. It was run, it were raining and snowing. <laughs> He had to take his shoe off. And normally if people are messing with their feet, it's like not a good sign. We were 20 miles down. But by the end of it, he was, I, he moved ahead of me going up this last hill. And so he's ahead of me. And I got up there. I had this guy filming it. And I asked him, I said, hey, I said, how did, how did Goggins look? He's like, he looked good. He came through here with, he had no shirt on and it was raining and snowing. <laughs> and he's like, he's yelling they don't fucking know me. And like, yeah. And I was like, and I was like, who is he yelling to? Yeah. And they're like, there's nobody up here. <laughs> just in the air. <laughs> so he got better at the end. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, yeah. that's funny. What, what, is, what, what do you guys eat when you're out there for that long? Do you guys bring, do you have to bring food with you or do you like just fast for a lot of that? Uh, you know, your body needs calories unless yeah. you, unless you, some people get fat burning and they get keto and they, they do, their bodies can run. And this one guy that I've run with before, um, he's run a hundred miles in 18 hours on no calories. <clears throat> Most wow. people, and you guys know it, if, even if you're going to lift for a while, you, you want to get some calories yeah. in, either the shake or something else. But when you're running for sure, you want to get, you know, a hundred calories an hour or something like that. That's what those gels are all about. Those gels have 90 calories. And towards the end of a race, you can pump that 90 calories of carbs in and, you know, get push you over. So yeah, you want to, you want to get some in depending on the length of the race. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a 200 mile multi-day race, then yeah, you got to eat, you got to stay up on the calories. Cause once you fall behind, you're never catching up. You, yeah. So on, on these long hunts, do you bring stuff like that yeah. with you too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Same stuff. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. How was, uh, how was hunting with Luke Bryan? How was he? Is he cool? Yeah. Oh no, he's great. He's a great, just Georgia boy. Uh, just nice as can be. Um, he had never really hunted bear. So it was pretty intense. It was pretty fun, but he had a show. He had two shows in Edmonton and I would hunt Alberta every year. So he had a day off. I think he had, I think it was Friday and a Sunday show in Edmonton. So we had one day and he ended up, he didn't get a bear, but we, we saw a bear and we we're close to bear. And uh, it was pretty fun. How did you guys link up? I mean, did he reach out to you? Were you guys friends before? How did that happen? Uh, my buddy, Rick Carone, was friends with him. and kind of introduced us. I think it was through Rick, mostly. Um, he's uh, He had a hunting show, too, or might maybe still does, called Buck Commander. It's on the Outdoor Channel. Okay. Him and Al Dean and uh, some other, like, pro baseball players. And so Rick Carone would film for them. And that was my friend. And he's since died of cancer um, he had pancreatic cancer, but he introduced us. And, and so we kind of went on some hunts together. Have now have any of these guys that you've taken on hunts like that? I mean, you've taken so many people, have they turned, I mean, like turned into lifelong friends like Joe is, yeah. is Joe like the only one, or has there been other guys that have, have turned into big friends? No, I mean, you know, anytime you go through something <clears throat> real like that, it, it I can imagine a, it's Bonds. a bond. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing, like a, a long, hard race or like me and Goggins training or a hunt like this, it's not just like, uh, hey, let's go let's go to dinner. You know, there's people you go to dinner with. You haven't experienced together. You don't care if you want to even ever see again. <laughs> and with hunting, it's not. It's like you have that thing because you got this common goal you're after, and you're willing to help each other out to get there. And that's, you know, I think people in the military have that a lot. They do, you know, mm -hmm. and they, it's like a brotherhood. Yeah. Well, it's, I don't want to. I don't want to say it's like that, but it's it's similar. Yeah, that's cool. no, you're you're a good friend to have because if the shit hits the fan, you know you're gonna survive. Yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, I There's see. no food. That's the goal. Yeah. 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 Oh, we'll we'll get Kill food. My buddy, my buddy can get us food. We're fine. Yeah, it feels good because you know with this whole COVID thing hit originally. You remember the like the meat was gone. Yeah. There's like oh, yeah. or there's like pretty sh the shelves were pretty bare and meat was like a thing and so I I did hook people up with meat and that felt good. You know, as hunters in in communities way back when hunters were providers. And so I've always, I like that mindset oh, yeah. about, you know, I killed this, here you go. 
there's some there's something powerful about handing people meat. You do kill. you pretty much do that every hunt? Because I know the f- friends that I know that were big into hunting. Almost every every kill they would come back and normally give some to some yeah. of their f- friends and stuff. I think it's like almost every hunter I know does that. Yes, yeah, like an unsaid rule. It or is. It's like because, like I said, in c- part of community, it was hunters provided. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were they, did they restrict hunting when when the pandemic started, or is that no? Okay. Good. I'm sure they they wouldn't have been able to even if they tried anyway i think no they well yeah i mean i think in washington i think there was a spring bear season and for some i don't even know how know how it makes sense that they didn't like you couldn't go fishing by yourself on a lake it's like what <laughs> it's so ridiculous. what makes why are you limiting sense. that yeah. it's yeah. like d- yeah just retarded like the surfer got arrested but, down yeah. yeah you can you can hunt but you got to wear mask yeah, yeah. <laughs> wear i don't know I, so i think they i think some states lost a couple seasons or, mm. or a season or two i know we couldn't go to canada so canada lost all their oh yeah out of like the from the guys from the states going up there oh, yeah. they they lost a lot of money the outfitter guides up there mm. Good oh, deal. Well, Cam, this has been great, man. Great yeah, having you on. Very, very man. interesting. Again, this is our, personally, we've just have yeah. lots of questions. We've been talking about this ourselves, and we got to ask oh, well, one thanks. of the best. So thanks for the yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, appreciate you having, having we you all wore black today. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm glad we got that, that text. Oh, I didn't even <laughs> notice that. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. No, this is great. I mean, I I I'm honored to be on the show, and thank you. And I love this. I mean, love what you guys are doing, and appreciate it. Awesome, man. Studio is great. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Good time, dude. Thanks.